All right, um, I do have a, uh, a video about lab three that I encourage you all to watch. I think it's a video. Let's look. My mistake, it's not a video, it's, it's just text, I think. Yeah. And this assignment seems a little daunting to people. And what I want to talk about to start off class today is I want to break down the assignment. And I want to illustrate that we have covered virtually all the concepts that you need in order to do that lab. I mean, I think we have, but we have. And so I'm going to start out today's class before I go into another example by talking about the lab three and pointing out where we've covered material for that lab. First of all, to review lab three, you will have a drop down, and you should have the numbers. 1 through 10 in that drop down, and you should probably have a blank space at the beginning to, to say, make your selection. Uh, let me view the exact text of. Lab 3, so I don't misstate it's been a while since I looked at it. Okay, the web page contains form it contain radio buttons, a drop down. All right, I lied. That's why I checked. You don't need to put a blank in there. Just have a number from zero to 10 and radio buttons for the different types of coins. So penny, nickel, dime, and quarter. And a button. It's not going to be a submit button because we're not going to send this to the server, but it should be just a plain old button. And when you click on the button, two things will happen. Well, several things will happen. First of all, the form will be validated. Now, if you have zero through 10 in this radio button, there's no need to validate that because it has to have a number from zero to 10 in it. All right, so you can get by without validating the drop down. You only have to validate the radio button. Where did we cover validating the radio button? We covered it in the example we talked about last week. Um, and if because we took this and we converted this to radio buttons. So if you review the lecture from last week, You'll see where I, I reviewed how to validate a radio button. So lecture last week talks about validating the radio button. All right. Assuming everything's okay and they've checked one of these or clicked on one of these radio buttons, you're going to do two things. You're going to display the total number. Of, of of the total value of the coins that you selected. So if you picked three nickels, you're going to say that that is 15 cents. All right. Where have we gone over something like that? We've gone over something like that also in example one. We've done a calculation that depending on the hours and depending on the type of employee they were, we're calculating their gross pay and we're displaying it on the page. So it's not the exact same calculation that you need to make, but it's very similar. Only differences are we're using a radio button where if you watch the uh, lecture last week, uh, you'll see the use of a radio button and uh, the calculations different. The calculation is, um, uh, you know, to multiply the value of the drop down by the value associated with the radio button. 
So that we covered in last week's example as well. Now, the one that might not seem obvious that we've covered relates to the displaying of the images. And if you display, in this case, you would display three nickels. And I've given you those images. If you make another choice and pick, for example, four dimes, it should wipe these out and display four dimes. Now, where have we done anything like this? Well, we've done things like this in last week's example where we create HTML. But in last week's example, we create the HTML as LIs within a UL. All right? Within LIs as a UL. Let's look at this example. Do that, we do that in the validation, validate form. All right, here we do, we, here we use, um, um, inner text to display form. We also created that image by using this code to create an image. So this shows you how to create an image tag and to put it somewhere on the page. So we have covered that in the example that we did last time. The one thing that we haven't done is covered how to put as many images as is selected in the drop down. So, from this example, you should get how to create the image for a penny, a nickel, a dime. What we haven't gone is the looping. And if you look, there should be some tutorials within the course resources that talk about four next loops. If not, we look at a for loop. Shows you how a for loop works. So this is how we would loop through five times. Replace five with a variable. Replace this text with the code that creates an image tag and adds it to the page. And you're in business. All right. Now, my suggestion for this, as well as for just about everything else you do in programming, is to break it down and do one piece at a time. And you can do these in almost any order. So, for example, maybe the first thing that you do is to get the validation working. That's all you do. And if they've selected uh, a drop down, uh, if they've selected uh, something from the radio buttons, then it's valid. Display it's valid on the page. If they haven't selected something, display some sort of error message. So, maybe just get the validation to work first. After you get that to work, work on displaying the value of the coins. And then finally, save for the last part, the creating of the image. 
that seems to be the part that students have a little bit of trouble uh, with. As always, you can ask me questions and I'll be happy to go over them. All right, let's look over today's example. And today's example is similar to what we did before and I'll show you how it works. And then We'll look at the code. Again, part of your job as a programmer is to look through and see all these examples and see the things we've done in the examples and be able to apply them to new situations. So, of course, I'm not going to give you an example exactly like what the assignment is, but I am going to give you examples where pieces of them are things that are very similar to the things that you need to do for the lab assignment. So in this case, we can type in the background color, foreground color, click change color, and we're gonna change the colors of that paragraph. And we're gonna keep a history of what we changed it to. So if I change the background color to red and the foreground color to yellow, red and yellow, right? We can also click and clear the history, which is something you'll need to do in the case of the coins as well. Why? Because if you go and do another calculation of coins, you want to wipe out the coins that were displayed before. So let's look at this. Right off the bat, you're going to see something different. And that is, let's look at the HTML. I don't have any HTML events in here. I don't have an on click method on this button or on this button. Well, how does the JavaScript work then if we don't have those events? We talked about when we first introduced JavaScript that you need user events to trigger JavaScript. Well, we're using user events, but we're associating the JavaScript code with the user events in a different way. And we're doing this to increase maintainability. When we talked about CSS in CISS 216, we talked about how it's important to have a clean separation between your HTML code and CSS code. We said you could then take the CSS code and put it in a separate file and share that file among several web pages. Well, we can do that with our JavaScript too. If we cleanly separate the JavaScript with the HTML, we can put the JavaScript in a separate file and without having to touch the HTML, we can make changes to the JavaScript and we can associate that. So how do we do this magic? First of all, you'll notice that we have an instruction right off the bat and this instruction is not included with any function. And when you have a JavaScript statement that's not included in a function, it will execute as soon as the browser hits that. Well, let's look at what this statement does. First of all, we have a, we're creating a listener event uh, an event listener. An event listener is simply code that waits for an event to happen, then it fires up. And the event that we are uh, looking at is load. Now, this is one of the many JavaScript events that we have. We 
we look at the list here. You'll see that there is a load event and that happens when the page has been loaded. At least that's what we're going to be looking for the page to be loaded. So we're saying we're telling the, the window to wait until the page is loaded and then execute this function. This line would be the equivalent of putting on the body tag. On load equals and then do something with our function name. All right, so this line up of code up here is the equivalent of this on load function. Well, why do we choose one versus the other? I told you this is a better way. This is a better way because we're including all our JavaScript stuff within a separate JavaScript section. And we don't have to touch the HTML at all. So just like there's a clean separation between our HTML and CSS, there's going to be a clean separation between our JavaScript and HTML. So why do we say unloaded? Or, or on load rather, why do we do the load event? We have to wait until the whole page is loaded before we go and do anything. Because if we try to do these things immediately, all right, if we try to do these things immediately, then we may try to find the button before that button was created in the HTML. So we wait until the page is loaded. And when the page is loaded, then we look and try to find the button for change and find the button for clear. We're going to ignore this console log here for a second. All right. I'm grabbing a pointer to the change button. So change button equals document get element by ID button change. That's going to grab a pointer to this button. So now that variable change button is that button on our page. And we're going to add event listener for click change color. So that will be the equivalent of how we did it last week of having an on click method here. But again, it's a better way to do it because it separates our JavaScript code from our HTML code. I didn't do it in this case, but I could take all this JavaScript code and put it in a separate file. Then I could potentially use it on other pages. So the way to read this is we're going to make it so that when you click on the button, we're calling this JavaScript function. Just like here, when the window loads, we're going to call page loaded. Finally, when we click the button, called clear button that we find on the page as an ID of button clear. We're calling the clear history function. So this page loaded event sets up our listeners, but it doesn't be a JavaScript as opposed to doing it in HTML. And that makes it a better way to work. Now, line seven says console log here. Let's say my code didn't work. All right. Let's say I screwed up and I put loaf here instead of load. And guess what? Our code doesn't work anymore. 
Well, I want to wonder why it doesn't work. Again, first thing you should do is you should look at the JavaScript console. In Chrome, you get to it this way. More tools, developer tools, console. And interestingly enough, there is not an error. Okay. JavaScript didn't give us an error, even though the statement was incorrect. I think that's odd, but that's the way it is. What I did is I put in line seven, a debugging statement. That will write to the council whatever message I put in there. So I noticed that I don't see this council log here. I don't see the word here appear in the council. That suggests to me that this page loaded event never ran. This page loaded function never ran. And then I could look and say, well, it's supposed to run when the page loads. I could look at the statement and say, ah, that should be load instead of loaf. Now, when I look, it says here. So I know that that page loaded event got called. So this is just a neat debugging tool. You want to make sure that your code is uh, is uh, your, your the the code is being hit, the function is hit. You can put a council log message, and you know here is pretty simple. What I would normally do is I would say page loaded function to tell me that I was in a page loaded function. Generally, it's probably best to get rid of these. This is only a debugging tool, but it can be a very effective debugging tool. You can also display the values of variables if you wanted to. <laughs> All right, so this page loaded event runs. We said when this page finished loading, execute this page loaded function. This page loaded function goes and it associates with the change button, the method or function change color, and with the clear button, the method clear history. So let's look at the change button, change color method. First thing we do is validate to make sure if the form is valid. See how we do that. Well, we're gonna assume it's valid until we find a problem. Remember, that's the easier way to code it. And again, if you don't believe me, try doing it the other way. Here I'm clearing out the error messages. It's useful to display your error messages on the page and not have an alert button go off because again, the alert button you have to close to make the change and you might forget which, which what the errors were. So in this case, there's an error, I display the error message right alongside the box that needs to be filled in. So the first thing I do is clean it out in case there was anything there before. Now I'm looking to see if document get element by ID text BG dot value equals an empty string. If it does, then the form is not valid and I display the error message must enter something. Do the same thing for the second. And then finally, I make sure that they're not equal because it would be bad if you made the background color and the foreground color the same. One thing that I don't have a check for is what if I enter red and FF0000. That'll get around by validation, but hey, nothing's perfect. So you put the code there, but 
is in red on a red background. Now, I kind of cheated a little bit here because if I put spaces in here, that's also the equivalent of not putting anything in. And yet, it doesn't recognize that as an error. So what I should do here is say dot trim. If you remember, dot trim gets rid of uh, leading and trailing spaces. So it strips out all the spaces. Everywhere I'm using the value, I should trim it to get rid of the spaces. You would only really need this for text boxes, but I thought it would be good to mention it. So make sure it still works. This is what's known as regression testing. All right. Whereas if you make a change, you make sure you don't broke, didn't break anything. So I type in red and white. All right, that worked. I put in some spaces. Validation works. And so on. It would make sure that that works. Still works. So this is going to return either a true or a false. So this value is either going to be a true or a false. If the value returned by validate form is true, that means that the form validated correctly. And we can go ahead and, and actually change the color. If it did not validate correctly, this is false and we don't execute anything in this if statement. Remember, we associated that button with this change color by saying this. All right, we grab the background color and foreground color. We set the style of that thing called changeable to set the background color and color. And we're creating an LI. And within that LI, we're creating a text node And we're appending that text now, we're appending the whole LI to our drop down. Not our drop down, I'm sorry, um, our uh, unordered list. That's an idea of history. So we create our LI, we create a text node, we add the text node to our LI, we grab a pointer to the history list, and then we append that child to there. This just makes the code a little bit cleaner. Alternatively, I could have done this. I could chain all these functions together and I could say, Yes. Some people like to do that because that reduces to just one line of code. Uh, for beginners, sometimes I show it both ways because uh, it's clear to some beginners one way versus the other way. Any questions at this point? Okay, 
That leaves us with one piece of functionality. What happens when we press the clear button? Clear history button. Well, we've defined our clear button as being this. And we've added the event listener of clear history. So when they click the clear history button, we execute this little loop. We find the history list and we create a while loop that as long as there is a child, in other words, as long as there is an LI within the history element, which is that UL, as long as there's an LI in it, we're going to loop through and we're going to remove the first child over and over and over again. And the result of this is that we get rid of everything in the LI. You'll need code like this to clear out your area where you're displaying the coin images. All right, now I mentioned that I could create a, a separate JavaScript file and include the code there. Let's do that now. Let's create a new text file. I'm going to copy all my JavaScript code. In here. I'm going to get rid of the script tag. You don't need the script tag if it's in a separate JavaScript file. You need the script tag, just like the style tag, you need the script tag if you're in an HTML document and you need to tell it that it's JavaScript. So I'm going to save this as I'll call it script.js. And there we go, out on disk is script.js. Now we need to include that in the JavaScript file. Uh, we need to include that in the HTML document. So it's known as external JavaScript, JavaScript file. And we just put this in our HTML. I usually put the JavaScript functions inside the head section. I've seen people put them at the very bottom of their code. That way they don't execute until the page is loaded, but we accomplish that by creating an onload function. we execute when the page is loaded. Now, this should work the same. And lo and behold, it does. So what we've done is we've achieved the same separation between JavaScript and, and HTML as we've achieved through uh, with, with cascading style sheets. And that's a good thing. Let's say this was functionality you wanted on every one of your web pages. I know that's a bit of a stretch, but let's say it was functionality we wanted on every one of them. As long as we made sure that this form was on every page, like maybe in the header of the page, and we could put that JavaScript file in the HTML 
and everything would work. If we found a bug in there, just like if we found a problem in our CSS, we would only need to make the change in one place and it would fix it everywhere. Are there any questions? I do want to preview what we're doing next week because this is fun. I'll talk about this more next week, but I do want to show you what we're going to cover next week. If you're still working on the coin problem and you're confused about that, maybe close your ears. All right. If you don't want to confuse yourself. But I think this is actually pretty cool. And this is something that's becoming more and more important. And our advisory committee, which is a group of people from industry that gives us suggestions about what to include on in our courses, suggested that we cover things like this. All right. I'm going to download this real, uh, this, uh, Real time weather app. And it's uh, in a Git repository. So I'm going to go here and download the zip file. Track that. And the way this works is this. When you open it up, the browser automatically asks us if we want this web page to know our location. Knowing your location is a security issue, right? Not everyone wants a, a web page to know where they're at for any number of reasons, privacy reasons or whatever. So, therefore, the browser can't tell automatically where you are located. It has to ask you first. Now, how does it know where you are? It depends on what device you're running this on. If you are running this on a phone and, or, or on a, uh, uh, even like a laptop that has GPS technology, it can give you a precise location of where you're at. If you're on a, if you're connected to the internet on a desktop machine or something, and there is no GPS available, it will be based on where your carrier is. <laughs> How you're connected to the internet. It takes your IP address and figures out where you're located. So it may actually, in some cases, give you uh, deceiving results. I'm going to click allow. And it tells us that in Sheffield, USA, it is six degrees Celsius and cloudy. Which if you look outside on this day, it indeed is very cloudy. We click on this, it converts it to Fahrenheit. This is all done via JavaScript. There's code that executes when the page loads. It asks for your location within JavaScript. Once we get that location, if we're given permission to get that location, we call a service to get back a file, or not a file, but data that relates to our weather. Then our JavaScript takes that weather and displays it on the page. So if you want to look ahead at this, look ahead at this code and study it because uh, your next assignment after this one will be to modify it. I think I've posted that already. Yep. 
lab for. All right, that's all I had for today. Please ask me any questions that you have. Uh, and I will be available in lab if anyone has questions right now. If not, please email any questions that you do end up having. Uh, we'll see you next week.